Okay, my name is Tara Mancini. Um, I have a blog um, called Calicos, Camelots, and Swords. It's about early um, colonial history in New York, um, which includes roughly 1600 through to the French and Indian War of uh, 1765. Um, and what I had done was I put together a database. Um, I used the New York State Archives which include a lot of 17th century documents, including a lot of probate inventories, shipping manifests, bills of lading, court records. And I put the, it into a database. It's primarily um, textiles, clothing, uh, metal works, anything a person would own um, or carry with them. And what the goal was is, is to see how people's lives changed over time. And by knowing I can pretty much tell you, like, you know, at one time during the Middle Ages, they had, they didn't sew their sleeves on, they were attachable. Um, and for some reason, even though everyone was switching over to sewn on sleeves, people in New Netherland and New York continued to have attachable sleeves right up until uh, 1700. So it's like things like that, um, that's what the database allows me to do is to see when they changed. And then, so for instance, if someone says to you, Colonial women never wore underpants. I can say, yeah, maybe in your colony, but <laughs> in mine we had them um, because it, it we we see over time. I can actually tell you roughly when they were introduced um, because of this. Um, so I'm going through one of the inventories, and um, I, I did actually set out on a mission to demonstrate. I'm Italian. We've always had underpants. Um, it appears that we invented them um, because the, day, um, the earliest record I found was uh, roughly the year, I think it was 1200, 1202, um, and there's actually a law. Um, our undershirts were called kamikas, and the law was passed that no man shall be publicly whipped without both his kamika and his underpants because previously it was just a shirt, and the, the idea was to preserve his um, dignity. So this idea of underpants being associated with dignity because Italians had a tendency to strip down a lot, go naked um, in the fields and in water and baths, and the priests didn't like this. Um, so as we move forward, uh, we'll see how Italian underwear made it to America during the colonial times. Um, Wiena van Hooven, she's an important person in the sense that um, Dutch women did not have restrictions on them when it came to um, their position in um, society. So in English society, women were one with their husbands. They lost their identity. The Dutch didn't like that idea. You, they didn't like it because if their women lost their identity, they couldn't make money, and Dutchmen really liked women that could make money. Um, they liked their trophy wives. So what they did was is, um, their overlord, their um, duke, at some point said, you know, I really don't like this. We're going to make women subservient. And this is the 16th century. And so what he did was is he wrote a law saying that um, women should be subservient to their husbands. And the Dutchmen didn't like this, so they quick wrote some laws and said, you know what? We're going to, women have their own identity. They keep their surnames. They can take out lines of credit. And we're going to label them as minorities to their husbands. And because they were labeled minorities and not um, one, they preserved pretty much their way of life. It was their workaround. And Weena was very um, a vivacious, outgoing type of person. We have very limited knowledge other than um, a few pieces of document. But when you go through her inventory, there is so much clothing. Um, there's, I mean, you're, you're, you know, 39 caps with lace and nine cornet caps. And her husband, um, who was a Dutchman, um, but he, or he was actually German and a doctor, and um, this is his little inventory, and it's like in one little corner of this like 20 page document. And um, what's interesting about them is, is they came to America, and this is his second wife. Um, they came to America and they open up side by side stores, side by side shops. She has an East Indies goods shop. She was importing from the East Indies and he was, had a doctor in practice. But just like her personal wardrobe that spilled over onto his side of things, her East Indies shop spilled over to his side. So when they go room by room, you have his doctoring office, and then they're like, and it's lined with shelves with china and paintings 
And you could see, you know, imagine these people getting their, you know, teeth done and different things and just staring at all the Asian goods for sale. Um, but what's interesting is, is despite the fact that she has a huge inventory and he has a tiny one, they have roughly the same number of drawers. And in this particular inventory, because it was taken after a law was passed that all public records have to be in English, um, they, the English recorder, um, and it was actually him, the, um, the husband put down most of this, they wrote the word drawers. Um, and the, this gets a little confusing in this time because the Dutch don't refer to them as drawers. And here we have the four yellow drawers. Um, they were worth about two pounds. Um, and then there was also three additional ones um, in an old chest. So those are probably the ones she came to America with and then she made four more. Does anyone want to guess what love drawers are? Yeah, they are. Believe it or not though, love is actually not the sexy part. Love is the name of a flimsy thick silk that was imported from Asia. Um, but the yellow, the yellow was the fun part. Um, Dutch people, married couples, really liked each other in the 17th century. And um, what's cute, there seems to, there's this like arms race. So Dutchmen at the beginning of the century discover Italian underpants. And um, it was a sign of you know, manly prowess, especially if they went all the way to the knee, boomer style. And um, so they adopt them in white, like the Italians wore. And the Dutch ladies liked them. And they said, you know, we want some for ourselves. So by mid-century, you start seeing Dutch ladies wearing them down to the knee. Um, and then the Dutchmen are like, wait a minute, you know, you appropriated our underpants. So, and as we move along, we'll see kind of what the guys do to counteract this. Jacob's underpants, you have a very reserved person. He wears black suits, gray suits, and he has silk underpants. And checker, too, and cotton imported from uh, India. So the white calico, calico is the name of the fabric, not necessarily always the print. And in this case, this is just white cotton underpants. Um, cotton is very popular in early New York, and the reason being is, is that it's very humid, very humid. They actually talk about this, and so they wanted light clothes, and linen is very good, but cotton is also very well adapted for this climate. And this is one of the, um, I think he got one page out of all the pages that there were in this inventory. So what was happening was in, uh, this is like one of the oldest documents I have of underpants outside of Italy. Um, and this is a pair of women's um, underpants. Italian women did not wear open drawers. That would have been like very risque. Um, and at the time, their corsets, sometimes they say, oh, corsets would be too long. They didn't, they weren't long at the time. They actually were only to your rib cage. They only fit your rib cage. So they didn't restrict your waist, they restricted your rib cage. There, there's a, a difference. And, um, but there was a piece that came down in the front, um, and what you could do is you could just unbutton them and take them down. Women's Italian underpants don't go all the way to the knee. That's like a big no-no with Italian men. Only Italian men can have underpants all the way to the knee. Um, but they did both have um, either, I, like this one I believe is ties, um, but the men's would have been buttoned. There would have been a cuff here and a cuff at the knee. And you start to see them um, uh, in uh, France. What happens is, is all things French or all things Italian become the thing and women begin wearing Britches, they call them britches because they were so long. Um, and it was questionable. One of the interesting things about underpants in France, so in Italy, people wore them because, well, the priest said, well, if Jesus can cover himself well up on the cross, so could you. And the idea was is that if you were gonna strip down or be exposed at any point, you needed underpants on. And so in France though, what ends up happening is, is the elite adopt them, but the lower levels, it takes an exceedingly long time for them to trickle down. And I don't have any evidence that anybody below the middle class wore them in France. Um, 
And actually, even at the middle class level, they, there is no evidence that they were wearing. It seems to be more of an upper class nobility type of thing. This is what the priest told the Italians, why you have to wear underpants also to you know, shield virgin eyes. Because when the guys are out there in the fields, their um, chemicals, unlike most, a lot of shirts up in uh, the northern parts of Europe were very short. So when the guys were out there hoeing in the fields, their bums were out and they needed to cover them. So we can actually see the spread of underpants out. What's interesting about the Netherlands is, is that unlike France, because the middle class was growing and booming, they had money, they wanted exotic goods. Underpants aren't the only things they adopted from Italy. There was also robes and fans and other garments. And you can actually see um, in this, um, over time, this little town outside of, um, in uh, South Highland, the, it slowly starts increasing in the number of people that wear underpants. <clears throat> I'm not sure why, but only half the population ever seems to adopt them and not the other half. And I suspect it has to do with income level and a little bit of a um, Mr. Fancy Pants type of issue um, because one of the things um, we end up seeing is, is you can see uh, it divided out by trade. Um, they all have undershirts, <coughs> but not everybody has them in um, the various levels. And the unskilled trade labor has a little bit less. And, but you're still making good money in uh, the Netherlands. You can make 600 uh, guilders a year, which would allow you to have meat once a week, you know, which is still very well off for the 17th century. But here, if you compare different towns, um, the one up at the top, dairy farming, was very profitable, and they have underpants. The women don't have quite as many. It's, uh, they're outside of the towns at this, or the bigger cities. So these, we're talking like the towns and villages with like maybe 500 people to 5,000 people. Um, when you're in the cities, the number of underpants increases, but you can kind of see that, you know, when you get down to fishing villages, they just, those are the, usually the poorest people. They don't have underpants. So underpants, there is definitely a correlation between income level and whether or not you have them. One note, why am I calling them underpants rather than drawers? Because the Dutch say underbrocken, and brocken is pants and under is under. Italians, calzones, pants, what do they call them? Soto calzone, the underpants. So historically, underpants is the correct term. Not drawers. Drawers are actually an Asian um, import. Ah, and here we have them. Um, so after, when people started traveling down to Italy, including artists, and they kept seeing people with underpants on, some people started putting them on images of Christ. Um, there's actually a couple of um, German ones and he's wearing little brief style ones because that's actually the underwear of the poor. Um, those, if you ever see um, women's underpants that are boy short style, that's the original one. Those ones are knitted in the round and they have a little drawstring and they're made out of wool and it's the belly wool. They would have been made out of so they were nice and soft. Those would actually be um, uh, the most historically correct. I do not have any evidence the little boy short ones made it to America though. Or, um, and the only ones that seem to have adopted it outside of Italy seem to be some of the Germans. It was actually the bloomer style that um, made it out of Italy. And the bloomer style came into fashion during the 1600s. And you can see uh, in Dutch paintings, if you look close, you can see the underpants. So we're in the phase now where the guys are walking around in white underwear. Um, it's usually linen. Um, it, could, it, it could also be cotton. Ah, there's no one under 13, right? Um, Dutch dolls have underpants on. So you can look at some clothing books and they'll say, dolls were dressed exactly like real human beings. And it's true, they do dress the dolls like real human beings and they say, because this doll doesn't have any underpants on, therefore, 
it, um, they don't have them, but they'll still have the pockets and the stockings and all the other little details. But that's an English doll. That's not a continental doll. There was a doll that showed up on Antiques Roadshow in England. It has velvet underpants on in the brief style. And I wanted to yell to the screen, it's Italian, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Um, so these are linen. Um, this doll um, is from a giant doll house with, I think, about 15 other dolls. Not everybody, and everyone in the doll house is dressed the way they would have at the time, okay? And one of the interesting things is there's three dolls from, I think it's the 1660s. They don't have underpants on. Not all the dolls in the doll house have underpants. If there's a few of them that are dressed from this little peasant village way outside of Amsterdam, they don't have underpants on. The fancy dress ladies all have underpants on. Um, and th this is a Swedish doll. Um, when I talk to the, um, I don't believe hers are split, I think hers are. And this is um, silk, it's called salmon, pink, um, in case you wanna make some. I actually made a pair of these. Um, oh, warning, if you decide to make a pair of these, you have to be careful because if you use a split pattern, um, you have to put back in the arch to get between the legs. Otherwise, when you go to sit, you really will split your underpants because there's not enough fabric, which happened, um, unfortunately, to the model, not me. Um, and this is a little bit later. But one of the interesting things is, is you can kind of see that they're actually sewn up. The Dutch would, um, when they did eventually get to the open back, they would sew down the front and only the rear is open. They're not just like pinned at the top. And there's a reason for that. It's because um, they liked ice skating and when they went flying and everything went up, there was at least some coverage. Aha, this is what the guys came up with to counteract the women in their white underpants. Red. It was the thing for a guy when they switched over from more the baggier pants to um, the ones with the button. They're like, well, now you can't see it, but I'm going to make sure the ladies can. They would leave them unbuttoned, see the red underpants underneath. It was very much to please the women. What's interesting about these paintings is, is he's a very wealthy person and he's got his silk underpants on. He's not. He's very much like middle, middle class. And the name of the painting is Beware of Luxury. And so if you have them in silk, it's considered luxurious. If there's um, drawers, underpants being sold in a small town in South Holland, and they're made out of wool. But in red, to look like the expensive ones. But you can tell by her face, they will not be outdone. The ladies will not be outdone. They're like, oh yeah, you're gonna do it in red? <laughs> And that's where um, the doll before this with pink, that was one of the colors they came up with. So this is later on. This is a painting around 1700. Um, let me see, what's she wearing? She's wearing, that's a Turkish robe. Um, the way you can tell the difference between a Japanese kimono and a Turkish robe in these old Dutch paintings is if the sleeve is so, sewn on. So if you see a seam here or a seam here, it's Turkish. It's not Japanese. If there's no seam, it's Japanese. Um, but you can see here, he had left the buttoning undone. So he's a very middle class. He doesn't have fancy clothes. Um, but yet, he had to show off his underpants. So he's clean. The idea is he's clean. He washes underwear every week. They wash their clothes every week, um, their underclothes. Um, and he's handing out money to the child. This child probably belongs to the shopkeepers. The shopkeepers are wearing Japanese kimonos. Um, that's a sign of um, worldly connections. Uh, so, um, one of the interesting things about that inventory I showed you in the beginning was is, um, uh, in there, he, in a barrel um, towards the end of the inventory, or actually this is a different, I'm sorry, a different inventory. Um, he's a doctor from Kingston, New York. He's not wealthy. Um, he's not poor either though, but he's from a small town and in a barrel were his clothes that he probably wore um, when he first came over, when he was younger. And in there was um, a leather doublet, 
he's not wearing leather, but it would have been very similar. Um, his old uh, Brock, but he also had red underpants on underneath. So he would have actually had this outfit right here in this image, um, the small town doctor in New York. And you can actually um, line up a lot of these outfits in the inventories with old Dutch paintings. <coughs> so um, I came up with these stats um, to fit my arguments when uh, people would uh, get very upset with me when I suggested that their grandparents wore underpants. Um, I actually had someone get really upset and just was like, no, my ancestors did not wear them. Because, um, <laughs> and there's a reason for this. Um, what ends up happening is, it's actually rather, it's like good but sad, um, the end result. What ends up happening is, is underwear develop in Italy as a way to keep one covered for modesty, okay? The Dutch adopt them because they view them as a way to keep clean. If you look at these, some of these old Dutch inventories, they found every brush to clean the house imaginable. Like there was all different kinds for all different purposes. They were just obsessed with cleanliness. And um, that's the reason. And the guys didn't care that the women had the same kind of underpants. They were women. The Italian guys wanted something a little different, but the, the Dutchmen, they're like, yeah, whatever. You know, she's the boss anyway. Um, and when they came to New York, they didn't seem to care. I can find them in, Dutch inventories, I find them in um, German and French. The French guys really had a lot of underpants on um, available to them. Um, and when I come to English inventories in New York, sometimes, like um, sometimes you'll see like a captain of the Navy, he will have one pair. And they do turn up occasionally in New England and some of the really early ones where they had made a stop in the Netherlands first and then came to America. You will see them with one pair. But I have, to my recollection, like, uh, for, when I, I think through my database, because um, I'm always adding them, I don't think I have any English women with underpants on. And there is a reason for this. Um, first of all, as stuff as culture and art comes out of Italy and that goes north, it takes time. It could take 100 years for stuff to get to England. Um, and what ends up happening is, as you figure, the Dutch women really go all out by about 1670. They actually wore breeches before this. Um, they would have worn breeches when it's cold or when they go out and you know they want something on. They would wear breeches, but it, it, this transition to underpants, that, that was... The, it's, it really represents women's independence because what happens is, is it gets to England in 1734. And the men, no offense, I love men, <laughs> refuse to allow them to wear them. Because it is conceived, it's, it's, it's perceived that if women start wearing them, they will start behaving like men. The next thing you know, they will start shaking hands. <laughs> and even worse, be like French Amazons and riding astride. And so, and I, I remember reading that and thinking, God, you know, it's because I'm so used to the, reading the Dutch, and the Dutch are just like, yeah, baby, go make money. And the English are like, no, you know what I mean? You, you cannot, is considered. And eventually, the, um, there's a really great print. I don't have a copy because I, I couldn't find one without a copyright. Um, they, they, they like Italian dress, and there's the one where the girl's dress comes up like this, and you see a pair of britches underneath. That is not an example of underpants because they send that around Pinterest and all these sites. That is actually, that is a prostitute, and she's wearing britches, specifically britches, because in Italy there were laws that men could not be with men, so there were women who dressed as men to cater to this market, and that is what she is. It's just that you see the image, but they don't give you the page that comes before that explains this, and that's what it says in Italian. So just be, so if you do see a woman outside of, um, well, anywhere with underpants that come down to here other than in the Netherlands, but the difference you can tell between britches 
and women's underpants is, is there's a cuff at the knee. The men's always have a cuff at the knee. The women's use a drawstring. And so that's how you can tell um, the difference. In, um, when you start getting to, let me see what the next one is. Ah, ha, ha, I had like, <laughs> she's got booty. Um, I do not know the origin of this image. I have tried to find it for the life of me. It is German, though. Um, it's possibly like Cologne or someplace like that, by the way, her headdresses and everything like that. Um, this is um, just a breakdown of what's in New York. There was a 19 linen. This is a, a slightly older count. I have more now. Um, 19 linen, 7 cotton calico, um, bubazine twill. Bubazine's a, a thicker, like uh, cotton wool. Uh, and fustine is also a cotton wool mix. Um, this isn't to all of them, but these are the ones that um, included some sort of description rather than just saying, you know, five pairs of drawers. Um, so it gives you a little bit of an idea of what they were using at the time. And these are some of the colors that were available. A lot of times when people are doing reenacting and you go to these historic sites, um, before they can get approval for adding something to their outfit, they have to have two primary sources. So, um, they, you know, they, they would not be allowed to use a color or a fabric that was not found during the era they're trying to represent. And that's it. Does anyone have any questions? We talked about the prostitutes wearing the breeches mm -hmm. during the event. Was there, were there um, specific underpants, for instance, that would be worn by prostitutes that would indicate? Was that, was that a thing? That the breeches would be for the cross-dressing um, women. And the couple images I've seen, um, the, there's an, a really old image of prostitutes coming in, and they're wearing the boy short style ones. Mm -hmm. But that's the common man. That's, that, that's the one that commoners, soldiers would have been, are outfitted with those. Those are eventually what become bathing suit shorts for Italians. Um, but to my knowledge, there's not a specific style other than women portraying women would have to be conforming to just slightly short of the knee. They don't say it quite like that, but you know, they, they will say women have a preference for this. It, it, um, the Italians in the 16th century um, developed this dictionary. They were so obsessed with trying to make sure Italian nev the language never changed. So they put in the word and also gave you all the citations to all the primary sources. So, um, and things like that. Um, so um, they have maxims. So like, for instance, um, that go back like to the 16th, 15th century. So if you're a person that's very frugal and tight with your money, you keep your money in your underpants. Um, and prolific burglars were um, called busy pants. Underpants, not pants, but underpants. You know, like you're so busy, your underpants are on the run. You know what I mean? And so like they, and they, what's nice is, is that they call them social de calzone, but the, one, the ones with the boy shorts, those are specifically, they have their own word. It's called mutande. And mutande comes from mutando, which means to change. Hint, hint, change your underpants on a regular basis. That's what they literally came from. That They, they were very obsessed with um, keeping that region clean, you know what I mean, if that makes sense. Yeah. Do you feel that the Dutch influenced uh, colonial people to start Start wearing them? Yeah, and part of it was because like when New Englanders came through or something like that, they would say, oh, the Dutch. Um, New York is so not English. And um, <laughs> um, even the people that really loved New York were like, they're so not English. <laughs> and um, it's good and bad in some ways because it did limit um, some of their growth. New York was tiny. It, compared to the growth Boston and Philadelphia saw, New York lagged way behind. And part of it was because they didn't have strong enough connections to England. Most, no one spoke English either, um, you know, until like well into the 18th century, you know. But um, 
they definitely influenced um, the Mid-Atlantic, um, but it was, I would say, if you're looking at anything before the French and Indian War, or including the French and Indian War, because truthfully, even going up to the Revolution where they really sucked at, you know, trying to keep up to date with fashions, is um, you would want to wear something that's sort of, is like in between continental and maybe a little English between the French and Indian War and the Revolutionary War. And before that, whatever ethnicity you are or county you're in, that's what you would wear. So like if you were in New Paltz, you would actually be wearing like a French continental fashion. If you were in Albany, you really have to wear Dutch fashion because like, you know, you would be an outsider otherwise, even if you were German or, you know. Um, what's interesting is, is there becomes this political divide. They really um, go at each other. And the French are divided. If you're a wealthy French landed person, you sided with the English. If you were middle class or lower, you sided with the Dutch because you needed a job. And the Dutch were always hiring. Where there wasn't enough English merchants, or I shouldn't say English because, you know, three out of four British people were Scottish in New York. We have so many Scots in New York. And you can see it in the way that they're writing and things like this. And if you were Scottish in New York, you were aspiring to be very English in your way, but you were um, ethnically Scottish. So it was very, you know, more continental. It wasn't part of the Renaissance in Italy, though. It's the time <coughs> period when sanitation ideas and things come out. And yeah. there's, I mean, it's so here, but it's a class symbol, too, because mm -hmm. you can afford silk mm -hmm. um, as opposed to wool or linen, which are scratchy and uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And you're more wealthy, you're going to wear the shave your head and wear the head covering. Yeah, yeah. The lice and yeah. All that stuff. Exactly. Out. And then if you come over here to the more colonial days, you know, New England time, you know, if you've got one shirt, mm -hmm. you're not worried about underwear. Yeah, much. depending on your province. So, what the Dutch did during the 17th century, actually before that, they invented the yacht and they invented this fly ship. It was like a galleon, like one of those Spanish galleons. It had the same number of people, like 16 people to sail it, but they doubled the size of the belly. So they could import the, twice the volume for half the price. And they just, the market, like the things you could buy in New York, you know, like, you know, one guy had a Japanese katana, there's Japanese kimonos, there's, you know, uh, Middle Eastern uh, mohair, you know. And so the Dutch had this tendency to, um, and when I say the Dutch, I'm referring to everyone continental because we get like a New Englander coming in, like the one woman, she says, um, you know, the English, they go very fashionable. Um, in New York, the English of New York go very fashionable, but the Dutch, and she starts describing their outfit. Um, and she's like, you know, they go very loose because they're wearing Japanese kimonos, they're loose, they're not fitted. And um, they, have, um, they have rings, they wear all these rings and they have pierced ears. And it's true, because I've seen earrings in inventories. And um, they wear French uh, fancy lace headdresses, you know. And they, they, and but she reduced everybody down to being either Dutch or English. But in the year 1700, the Dutch were getting diluted down in population, and there were very, very few um, English people. In fact, the, the the English governors are like, please send English people here. We're just surrounded by French and Dutch and German people. And there just was not, people were not coming. The Scots were coming. And the Scots start coming a lot in the 1720s. So I got off topic because I really like my topic. <laughs> Did I answer your question? OK, thank you. I actually, um, I have a blog. And on my blog, um, I look for trends. So each blog post follows a trend, whether it's Japanese kimonos or a textile like Wadmo, which was in the previous talk, or um, Surge. And um, I follow it from like when it shows up until it kind of ends. Um, and so my topics can be like all over the place. But it's founded in the primary sources. Okay, I, yeah, go ahead. I'll go very specific on my family. OK. So, so the dead are uh -huh. in OK. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anglicized, married in with all the Scots Irish in the Oh, they did? In New yeah. York? No, in, so they came into Virginia. Oh, okay. Yeah, that so makes sense. Yeah. 
So would they have worn underpants? <laughs> <laughs> the guys did. Because he, it was the it was the the timing because of the 1745. Um, German guys were wearing underpants. They wore the uh, well. German guys are kind of interesting. Um, they like the boy shorts. They also like thongs. Yeah. <laughs> not, 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 there is coverage, you know, in the back. But um, you know the ones that tie on the side. Those ones, yeah, they like those. Wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, there's a couple old images about like the fighting over power of the underpants type stuff. And um, sometimes you see it with britches, fighting over the britches, but sometimes you see it with underpants. And there's a German one with the underpants and she has the boy short ones. And they kind of followed the German way where it was like, if her underpants were bigger than his, well then she's the boss. Mm -hmm. And so they put the boy ones on her. And because, you know, guys also wore the tie ones. And so, like, she would have had to go with, like, a full thong to get smaller than the German, how small the German ones were, yeah. Yeah. It's a whole different state of Yeah, in fact, um, in, like, places like France and Italy, there actually become people that specialize in making these things. Um, but in Italy, it was, it was a way to employ um, people um, with handicaps. They would make the underpants. Um, eventually, Italy will, in, like, 1830, they, um, it, it was probably invented before this, but they, um, so one of the manufacturers invents um, a knitting machine, a couple of knitting machines that a child as young as like six years old can run two machines making underpants. So, and how many, and, um, it gets to a point by that point, because England isn't always wearing them. There's documents in like 1830, they're like, oh, I went to the Netherlands and the women wear underpants. You know what I mean, under their dresses, and it's like, come on, people. And, um, but in Italy, um, they got the price down. You can buy a pack of 12 for one lira. And so they won an award for that, that one manufacturer. Because he got, you know, the, the whole idea was it was always to be affordable. The priests <coughs> back in the Middle Ages, the poor people, when they died, um, they would be stripped down, washed, because you had to be washed before you were um, buried. And um, they were given a fresh pair of underpants because you could not be buried unclothed because Jesus had was covered. You know what I mean? So whatever he did, that's the way you had to behave, you know, kind of thing. So oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Twenty one, you made me wonder about sort of the manufacturing aspect of it before the industrial revolution and all of that. Did people make their own underpants? Did so the, the lower income people, the women would have knitted them in the round like a sock. So you'd have to knit one leg and the other, and so it's this little um, boy short style with a little drawstring at the waist. Whereas if the, like in Rome, um, the guys had moved on to the knee length ones, the fancier ones, and um, those he, you know, he would have sent out, you know, anyone with wealth. Italy didn't have an even distribution of wealth. Whereas the Netherlands, um, I think it's a 64% of the entire population um, was middle class or higher. So there were shops? Where yeah. Go yeah, you, you would have gone to a seamstress. There's one document a boy had done some work for a seamstress, and his payment was, I think, a pair of stockings and a pair of underwear. So, and he was 16. Um, there's a couple of them, um, I think I have two primary sources that show 14 year old boys with underpants in their inventories. So I don't know exactly when girls would have worn them, but you know, probably similar age range. But the Dutch, you were considered a baby until you were about 14 years old. You were not apprenticed until you were 14 years old. Where in other colonies, you could have been five. You know, majority in New Netherland and in New York in general was 21 for a girl and 24 for a boy. I was just gonna ask about your primary sources. Were they diaries, letters, um, mostly? Probate Most, the majority of them are probate inventories. Um, sometimes if there's no probate inventory, they'll put something in like a, um, a will. Um, sometimes they were court records, um, like the one about the boy who did work but didn't receive, he got the stockings but he didn't get the underwear and he wanted them. Um, sometimes, in the, I have a 1634 bill of lading that included 24 large uh, shirts, 24 small shirts, and 24 pairs of underpants. 
in 24 stockings and 24 shoes. Because um, on the Hudson area, it was so humid and mucky and they didn't expect it to be so bad. He, the director wrote home and said, please send more supplies because we're having to do our laundry more than normal, which would have been once a week. And so they were probably doing it twice a week and they were probably just walking around in their underwear while waiting for the laundry to get done. <coughs> Anything else? Oh, I was going to come back to that. So anyone want to guess why, well, red for the guys was, you know, I'm powerful, I'm awesome. Um, you know why yellow? It's for specifically um, if a wife wanted to be alluring to her husband. Um, it was, um, it meant she was uh, um, dedicated to him. She was uh, um it was, she would not have sex with anyone else if she wore red under, or yellow underwear, essentially. It meant she was dedicated to him, but it was meant to be a tease because she's wearing yellow underpants, but you know, you gotta get through them kind of thing. <laughs> and she has the only, she's the only one with the power to take them off, you know, so to speak. So that's what it was. It's, it's actually, they phrased it much better than I just did, but yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? How did you start this topic? Someone said colonial women did not wear underpants. And I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, it's like I have, I mean, I'm mostly Italian, but I had a uh, German family that came over in um, 1755, roughly. There was a few, few ships that came with them. And they came into Pennsylvania and then went down to um, North Carolina. And I kept hearing this, you know, everybody would just throw off their clothes and adopt English ways. And I actually have family that came here to Jamestown too. So I'm not like completely biased. I mean, I, I, you know, we were one of the original settlers down in Jamestown, but you know, they would not have worn underpants, but my German side, there's no way they would just throw off their clothes. They were too frugal. Like they kept everything. You know what I mean? And so they would have retained their lifestyle. And so when you do have people coming over and it's the 17th century, they really should be keeping very close to their original ethnic clothing style and things like that, if that makes sense, at least for the mid-Atlantic and then through there, if that makes sense. Even if you're mixing, you would stay pretty close. Any other questions? It could be... Not exactly on underpants, too. <laughs> have you read Vermeer's Hat, the book? No, I have It's a good book about the trade of um, Amsterdam, Dutch trade throughout the world. Oh, and to how read it. They, their trade was so enormous. It was. They included it in their paintings, and, and you can see a lot of how um, people bought and traded yeah. items from around the world yeah. in their paintings. Yeah, yeah there's like um, alabaster. Um, saucers. And for there to be alabaster saucers, it had to have come from Egypt because only one was hard enough to do that. You know, and like I said, the Japanese uh, katana right? yeah. and things like that. There is um, samars, which are from Italy. There is um, a lot of Dutch textiles. Um, it's cute because um, there's a Scottish merchant in the 18th century. And he's like, please send me the latest fashions of calicos with the prints. And he sent this beautiful fabric with small sp sprigs, those, you know, like those beautiful colonial gowns. And he goes, it won't sell. They want the big stuff. You know, send the big, you know. And this Dutch woman, she's like, she sends off to England for um, fabric too to sell. She was a, a merchant female. And... Um, she writes back, she goes, no, I drew you a picture and everything, big. She's like, big, go big with the prints. And they're like, oh, God. So they have to then order from the continent to England then to ship to. So it's like, either way, because like the New Yorkers, they like big and bodacious. They wanted, you know, flamboyant. yeah, yeah. What was so strange is, is that it was flamboyant prints, but the outfits were not. They were not like laced out and things like that. So it was kind of like a pick and choose kind of how are you going to be flamboyant? Yeah. Good? Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
<laughs> My car died like three times trying to get here, and so now I gotta, yeah, it's just, you know, I gotta go one. What other talk uh, were you looking forward to?